Um, thanks so much for coming to listen to me speak. Um, I just want to, the first thing I want to say is that I'm Jane Middleman, um, and I am not going to say anything today that you've never heard before. I'm going to tell you um, how I've experienced it myself. Um, so the first thing is that I now teach at St. Paul School in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, but before that, I got a public education. I went to Temple University and studied mechanical engineering. Um, thank Shut you. Shut up from Pennsylvania, that's all. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I studied mechanical engineering there. And so the experiences that I talk about today will be both from myself as a student as well as now myself as an educator. Um, so also part of what I'm doing at St. Paul School is that I'm part of a program called the Penn Residency Masters in Teaching Program, which means that I'm at St. Paul School for two years while simultaneously getting my Masters in Education from the University of Pennsylvania. So I take classes online, um, I go to the University of Pennsylvania throughout the year and take classes in person, I'm writing papers constantly, filming my students constantly, um, and then also teaching. Um, and then the last point of introduction is that Mia Hebro is here with me today. Um, she is one of my students that has been through my classes this year in the engineering lab. Um, and she's going to help be part of my uh, photo and video examples and then also be a part of answering some questions at the end for you guys. Okay. So the first thing that I want to start with is how I got some of my skills. Um, and a lot of those come from what I learned at Temple University. Um, and so what I'm going to start with is that we're all going to do a practice that I do in some of my classes. And I don't have enough for this. Um, so we're going to do what's called the fist to five technique. And that is that throughout this presentation, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Um, and I'm going to ask fist to five. If you don't understand at all what I'm talking about, you're going to put up a fist. If you understand exactly what I'm talking about, you're going to put up a five. And then anywhere in between with your confidence level of what we're talking about. So it's sort of a way that maybe I'm going to talk about something, um, and I would give an introduction if you all put up a fist, and if you all give me five, five, figure, five fingers, uh, we'll just move right into it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So the first video right here. <laughs> yeah, fist to five. How does that sound? <laughs> um, so this first video right here is from my freshman year at Temple University. This is one of my professors. I took a course called Intro to Engineering where it was broken up into a number of different sections um, that was essentially to tell students, just because you think what kind of engineering you want to study doesn't mean you actually know. Um, so we were given an introduction to electrical programming, um, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, um, and even a little bit of bioengineering, um, with the final project being a hovercraft. Um, so this is um, <laughs> my professor being very excited um, and showing us probably day five of classes um, what the best uh, design of, so we had the option to build a hovercraft or to build um, a little UAV. Um, he built a, built a UAV. So, we play that. Ah! Damn, I'm good. What I really want to show you guys with that is what my classroom environment was like throughout a lot of my schooling. Um, and when I say a lot, I do not mean all. I sat in a lecture hall. I sat in a lecture hall often. Um, I even had online classes despite the fact that I lived on campus at times. Professor would email us and say, I can't show up today, meet us online. Um, and so I do not mean that it was perfect, um, but I did have some professors that were really wonderful. Um, and so what I really learned from this in the beginning is that I, I told a story that's a little bit of a sad one, um, that I sat there on day one of my classes at Temple, and I raised my hand to ask a question that I thought was a very good one, um, to which my professor on day one of a four-year college uh, that's pretty big, pretty well known, um, said, this is why girls don't belong in engineering. And I was crushed, like absolutely crushed. Like I went home that day, I called my parents, and I still like get chills in my bones when I tell you this, like called my parents and I was like, I don't belong here, what's happening? Um, totally, totally blew my mind that someone would say that to me. Um, I certainly had been put down for being a girl that liked science before, but never, never by an educator. Um, and so it was heartbreaking for me. Um, I, of course, decided to not let that get to me. Um, I befriended the dean that day and had a nice conversation, <laughs> um, which might say more about me than anything else I say today. Um, 
but uh, I moved on and really what the point of all of this is is that um, I was then told throughout my career at en of engineering at Temple um, at different points by classmates you flirted your way to this degree you flirted your way to that A you know the professor just feels bad for you you know you got a good group because you're a cute girl I got those comments all the time all the time I watched my friends of color get the comments that they only were there for pity that no one actually wanted them there that they were chosen to be a part of it because Temple needed the numbers I got told that I was just a number over and over again um, and what this really did for me and what um, you know this class is was the beginning of it all showed me that project-based learning gave me the opportunity to say you can't tell me I flirted my way to build this I built this this flies it works the app is connected to my phone it comes up off the ground it maneuvers the way it's supposed to you can't flirt your way to knowledge you can't be a number to make something work you have to actually do it so this was the first class that taught me that um, and then I'll show you some of the other ones so this next project was then junior year of college um, I took a course that all mechanical engineering students take um, so I guess I'll do a check-in before I do that join us <laughs> I'll do a check-in. So how many people here, by a show of hands, works um, with something related to engineering? And does that mean everybody else here works in education also somehow? Yeah? Awesome. Okay. So um, within engineering, a very common course that I believe almost every engineering student takes is called machine design, if you study mechanical engineering, um, at which point you learn a number of different things, including gear ratios, which is essentially telling you if you have a motor connected to a gear that interacts with another gear, um, at what ratio that those gears need to interact um, in order to accomplish what you want. <coughs> um, then the next thing that you learn is about, um, when you look at a screw, you can't, I'm not sure you can tell, but these, these shafts actually um, have threads on them. Um, and you learn about the angle at which something is threaded and why it's threaded that way. Um, and then the amount of clearance that you need between different objects. So all of this was great. It was fascinating in a textbook, but it really was not, it didn't mean that much to me. Um, and so we learned about it every day and we were told throughout the term, you're going to make a can crusher. It kind of became a joke. We didn't even really know what that meant for a while. Um, and then we were eventually told you're gonna to be given a motor, nothing else, and you need to crush an, alumin an empty aluminum can in under 15 seconds. Um, and he said, you will learn everything you need to know in order to make that happen. Um, we were convinced we could just stomp on it um, <laughs> and he made it clear that that was not the case um, and so the next video that I'm going to show you is essentially um, I just want you to imagine if you've ever heard a classroom sound like this when students are reading a textbook or taking notes so that's really what I want you to keep in mind go go for it do it go 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 sound like that when you have students with textbooks in front of them? <laughs> Has anyone ever taught an online class and had students screaming on the other end of it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this for me was the same idea that I talked about in the beginning. Um, this class in particular was one of the hardest classes I took throughout my career at Temple. Um, constantly studying. We were given a take-home exam to which I got 100% on. Only one other student in my class of 20 students got 100%, who was also a female, who's the one filming and screaming throughout this. Um, and we were both told very clearly, you got pity A's. And the funniest part about that is the professor who gave me that pity A is the professor who asked me on day one of college, when I asked him a question, said to me, this is why girls don't belong in engineering. So I promise you, that was not a pity A. And I got to prove that in that moment. Um, so I don't know if you remember, there was a girl here in a red shirt, that's me. I haven't aged much, so you probably recognize me. Um, and then there's a girl next to me named Jasmine, who you'll see again. Um, Jasmine is um, a girl of color who is in my class. Um, and you'll see a lot of the same faces because what you'll find is that students who don't fit in stick together. 
Um, throughout my entire time at Temple today, I was actually finishing up this project, and I texted Jasmine, who is there, um, and Haley, who's taking the video. I said, do you guys have any videos from school? You have a video of the can crusher, because I, don't, I can't find it on my computer. And they said, of course, and they sent it to me right away from their engineering desks right now. Um, and so we really stuck together, um, which was a huge part of all of this for me, is that you'll notice at any point, um, if you walk into an engineering college, um, we had a space, not quite as nice as this, but a, a nice space to study. Um, and we were divided by race and by gender. Um, and then in particular, you could find, and it's not anything against them, but the white males sat together and everybody else mingled amongst each other. Um, there was a clear division between the students that felt they belonged there and the students that felt they didn't. Um, and it was, there was no animosity between the two. Um, in terms, from my perspective, perspective at least, I never had any hard feelings towards them. There were the particular students who said harsh things to me, um, but I liked them just as much, but it was very clear they did not mingle the way that the rest of us did. Um, okay, so this one is one I'm very proud of. This is my senior design project. Um, so this is the first Jasmine that I just talked to you about. This is Haley. Um, and that girl is also named Jasmine. Um, and this is our senior design project. The reason why I added this is because Temple University um, had a statement for their senior design program that you couldn't have a group of all females. That it, and I went to the dean and I said, why do you have this statement? And he said, oh, it just hasn't seemed right. I said, you don't have a, a, any statement that says you can't have a group of all men. And they said, no. I said, okay, so explain this to me then. And I sat there and I had no problem. I said, I'll wait all day. Tell me why this is the case. <laughs> so of course he changed it. And here we are as the first all-female uh, senior design group. Um, we actually went on to a competition um, where we entered in a video of ourselves. Um, we won third overall uh, nationally with our project that we created. Um, we used biomimicry, if you care at all, to um, redesign the airfoil on a UAV. Um, so desert locusts, well actually, we'll do some Fist of Five right now. So Fist of Five about UAVs, where are we at? Okay, so UAV as an acronym stands for Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. Um, so that is usually in everyday terms called a drone, um, but sometimes it can be more complex than that. Um, and drone often doesn't denote um, the option for both an airplane-like device as well as a helicopter-like device. Um, so basically we were working with an agricultural UAV. Um, the goal of it to be to fly over a farm with a camera and be able to recognize different temperatures and crops um, to be able to tell whether or not the soil was wet enough for plants to grow, um, how the temperature was doing, and whether or not there were different pests in the farms. Um, and we, so desert locusts have a special kind of wing, it's actually in this back of this image, um, with wrinkles in it and um, we applied wrinkles to our airfoil um, and found a more efficient airfoil so that the plane, the battery charge, the same battery charge could last twice as long because we increased the lift so much. Um, so all of this being that senior year of college was exactly what you're looking at. I spent every day in the lab working on testing. I went out and met with engineers that laughed at me when I told them I was in engineering programs. I called on the phone to speak to different engineers about their drones, and they told me, who are you? Are you from marketing? And I said, no, I'm studying engineering. And they said, I don't believe you. Um, I literally got to the point where I had my brother call up companies that didn't believe me to make him ask the questions, where I would sit there, tell him the questions because he had no knowledge, and make him repeat them to the company to which he got answers. Um, very infuriating, but it was wonderful that in the end, um, I had something that once again, I could prove I built this and I made this and you can't tell me I used anything about myself except for my brain to accomplish what I said I was going to. Okay, a little bit about mentoring. As you can notice, either side of me are two white men. They were my mentors. <laughs> this one right here is John Fred Crane, who was my high school physics teacher. Um, I walked into physics the first day of junior year in high school, um, and right after class ended, um, he stopped me and he said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He said, what do you think you want to do with your life? And I said, I don't know. And he said, give me some ideas. 
And I went through the most ridiculous list. I went through a list that certainly included um, that I considered being a rabbi in the military. Sounded interesting <laughs> to me at that point. Uh, I went through that I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Um, I said that maybe I'd want to work in hospitals with children. I had absolutely no idea. Like I threw darts all over the dartboard, um, to which he proceeded to laugh at me and told me you should consider engineering. And I was like, I just met you. And he was like, you had great answers to my questions today. And I said, okay. And I, I laughed at him. Um, and a year later, I was supposed to be changing from physics to anatomy as the usual high school curriculum in the state of New Jersey goes. Um, and he said, you should take AP physics. And I said, okay, that sounds interesting. I'd rather not dissect cats if I don't have to. <laughs> um, and so I took AP physics. Um, about a week into senior year, he said, you should be my lab assistant. You should come in during your free period, and you should help me teach my first year physics class. You should help me set up my labs. And I was like, why would I do that? I have a free period. It's my senior year of high school. <laughs> he said, you're going to thank me. You're going to appreciate this. Um, and so I did. I went in every day, and I helped him set up his labs, and I helped teach his physics class for students that were a year younger than me, finishing a class I just got done with. Um, and what I did was I helped him, as a senior in high school, redesign his curriculum so that instead of having three days of lecture followed by one or two days of labs, we did labs every single day. What that meant was that a lab assistant usually took up about one or two of their free periods every week, and I took up all five of mine to help him. Uh, but we were determined that this was going to work, and we were determined that it was going to help students. And what we found that year was that the girls in the class all of a sudden had the same grades as the boys, and that the students of color also did. And that all of a sudden, instead of the students being all across the board, they were much more in line with each other. And when you asked the students, are you good at physics, they all said yes. The year before, if you asked me and you asked my peers, now of course I've studied engineering at this point, I am pretty good at physics, and I could say that with confidence, but if you had asked me, even finishing with an A in that class, are you good at physics, my answer was no. And my answer was no because I was told I wasn't good at physics. I was told over and over again. And instead, we redesigned that class so that it was all about projects. Every day you showed up and you didn't learn anything. You were given what we called playtime, um, where you showed up and you were given the tools for a lab and not told what to do with them. No risk of failure, no grade. And day one, all you did was explore. Day two, you followed along with the professor, with well, the teacher, I'm sorry, as he and I showed the students this is what you should be accomplishing. And day three of the lab, you were free to go farther beyond what we learned the day before. Um, and so all of a sudden, the students had the ability to fail. Um, they had the ability to do everything hands-on. And bigger than all of that is that they had the ability to choose their own lab partners, which for me, gave um, the knowledge and the opportunity that students could work with people that they were comfortable with rather than people that they felt forced to work with. Um, because I definitely had times where I was forced to work with students that treated me like I was the useless one in the group. Um, so he's incredible. That's the moral of that story. Okay, now this picture is one of my favorites. This is from my graduation at Temple. My dad took it, and just for some perspective, you can see one, two, three, four. And then, of course, so that's four girls that you're looking at. Um, oh, I'm sorry, five. And then there's only two that are missing that were in my group, and that is all of us. This was a graduation of thousands and thousands of students, um, to which my dad took, and my dad takes a lot of pictures. I sorted through a couple hundred to find this one because I knew it was there. To which he told me very proudly, I think I got a picture with all of the girls. <laughs> and. Um, what that really did for me was just give some perspective um, on how proud of us I was. Um, and then in addition to that was that out of all of those girls, there were only two of us that finished it in four years. Um, and so if you look at the rates overall of different students of color, students of different genders um, or non-binary finishing engineering degrees, um, white men finish in four years and the rest of them typically don't. Okay, so now we get to St. Paul's. So I took everything I learned. Uh, I interviewed for some engineering positions. I got offered a lot of money. And then I interviewed at St. Paul's and they said, it'll be fun. And I said, fun sounds great. <laughs> and so I took the job. 
Um, and from the very beginning, I decided that we would also do project-based learning. Um, they, I would do my best to never stand up in front and talk like I am today. I think I might have done so for the longest I've done all year. Mia can attest to this. I think I spoke for maybe 12 minutes today in the beginning of class, something I try to never do. Um, and so, background, uh, fist to five, where are we at with pedagogies? Okay, so pedagogy in general terms um, is essentially ways to approach a classroom. Um, and ways to do so usually with the focus being on student-centered learning rather than teacher-centered learning as I'm doing to you right now. Um, and so uh, my favorite pedagogy is one called the fishbowl, which is where you take half, you split your class in half. You have one half of the class in the center completing some kind of task, could be anything, um, and the other half of the class on the outside watching, um, observing, taking notes maybe, or maybe just recognizing things in their mind, and then you switch. Um, sometimes having a conversation about what changes between being the first and second group and sometimes not having any conversation at all depending on your goals. Um, so this one, uh, you can see Mia off to the right, I'll pay us for a little bit, um, is actually very simple. This, I believe, was like week one of classes, week two of classes, is that right? Yeah. Um, the very beginning of the year. These are all little toy car pieces, they're wooden cars that fit together with about six wooden pieces a plastic top and then four wheels um, and I challenged them so this is the second group going I challenged them to um, first have I believe two minutes of brainstorming and then they would have a couple minutes afterwards also timed um, to put it together and see how efficient they could be um, so when they were brainstorming they weren't allowed to touch the pieces um, and then they were so I'll play a couple little clips brainstorming about what to do. Um, something that I found interesting was that you can very clearly watch um, the student in the center, Olivia, um, decides to take the lead. She was not told she needed to, um, and she decided to. And so since then, something that I've done is that at different points throughout the year, I allow the students to essentially self-assign. Um, and then at other points, I let them know in advance, you are the group leader. Um, you know, you are the person who's in charge of making sure that everybody's kind to each other. You are the note taker. Um, you know, you're the person that's hands on, depending on what the project is. Um, and at times, I let them go off on their own. I see where they're at and what they choose to do. And then at other times, I assign them um, these roles. And you can see them actually building. Thank <laughs> you. 
watch is actually exactly what you just noted um, is that the students don't like to brainstorm if you give students a task and you tell them to go do it they take it as a challenge and they want to go do it they don't want to tell you how they're going to do it and afterwards they don't even want to tell you how they did it they just want to do it um, so this is actually one of the problems with project-based learning is that you need to force um, the brainstorming and then you need to force the reflection um, something that I agree I think often doesn't happen um, and I will talk about a little bit more how I've forced it into my spring term class that Mia can then tell you whether or not she liked or not um, with the idea that I've made writing a huge component of my engineering class something that most engineering classes don't have um, so this was them so they're building you could see they I, I mean maybe this looks normal to you I'm not sure I've taught a number of different classes I've been in a number of different classes um, the amount of laughing that's happening here was definitely not typical of a lot of my high school classes. Um, the politeness amongst them, Mia says, uh, like, actually says please when she's asking for a piece. Like, that is definitely a characteristic of Mia herself, but it also is a characteristic of the way that we framed this. Um, so I, I have rules in my classroom, um, and, one of the, and one of the rules is for myself is that when I do something, it has a purpose. Um, and everything that I do has to follow that purpose for the year. That my expectations in my class can't change because it's confusing. Um, I definitely had teachers that, can, that changed their expectations and I didn't like it. Um, so throughout the year, um, I've made my expectations very clear that students need to be kind to each other and that when we're in the classroom, anyone can ask anyone a question. And if you are asked a question, you have the responsibility to answer that question to the best of your ability. Um, and then if at any point you don't have the answer, you can always ask me, and then I have the responsibility to answer that for you. Um, teachers who say, go figure it out, uh, I don't think it's the right answer, personally. <laughs> I think that is essentially what we want to say to students, but I don't think it's the way to say it. Um, to give them the tools to figure it out is completely different than telling them to figure it out. Um, so. Part of this being week one was that I needed them to trust each other. I needed them to be willing to work together. Um, I needed them to be willing to ask each other and not ask me. And that if they needed to ask me, they could do so afterwards. Um, so now you'll see the last little clip is they're me forcing them to have a reflection about how they think it went. <laughs> Okay, what do you guys think went better about your group versus the other group? They went by color. We organized by color. Okay. We kept our shells. Yeah. Yes. Also, you weren't screaming at each other. You know what? I used to <laughs> So, uh, as you can see, they reflected on what they did better, especially being kind to each other. Um, and even in this case, I didn't do a lot of forced reflection. That was a short one. Um, it is like pulling teeth to ask engineering students how they did what they did. Um, it's something that I've learned for myself as well as over time, is that as soon as they do it, they just want to show you that they did it. Um, and so it's definitely one of the hardest parts. Um, okay, this one's a little anecdote. You have to promise me not to tell her how much I am probably embarrass her by telling her the story. I told her I was gonna tell it, she knows. Um, but she, she told me she didn't want to know the details. Um, this is Catherine Foster, who's one of my students. And Catherine walked in on the first day of robotic season, which is our fall term, I mean our winter term course. And I said, you know, can you grab me that nut and bolt? And she just looked at me. And I said, do you know which one is the nut? And she said, no. And I said, okay, we'll back up. And I did what I have promised myself I would vow to do, which in this case was one of the hardest times that I've ever had to do it. And that is that I've promised that any time I'm asked a question, I will back up until I find where the student is at, and then we will move forward together. 
Um, so that same way that I do the check-in, I see where you guys are at, I decide if I should move forward or if I should explain something to you. I do the same thing one-on-one -on -one in my classes every day. Um, and this was one of the hardest and then one of the most rewarding opportunities I was given. Um, so this was about three weeks into the course, at which point every day we had to talk about the difference between a Phillips head and a flat head. I had to show her what a drill was and how to put the battery in it. We had to have conversations about how when you twist something to the left or counterclockwise that it loosens it and to the right tightens it. And I asked her very, I kind of like was joking, I tried not to joke too much, I said, how do you open a water bottle? And I said, do you just try every time and see which one works? And she said, yeah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we've got a harder chance than I thought we were gonna have. Um, and then this, I literally sent this to my dad afterwards, this is one of my proudest teaching moments, is that this is our robot um, for first robotics. Um, so this is what was going, this was a winch, um, that was one of the things the robot needed to do. It ends up being um, pretty tall, and this year I think it was about four feet tall. Um, it weighs more than I do, it weighs about 150 pounds. Um, and it needed to be able to lift itself up on a rope um, by itself. And so, um, Catherine was now at a point where, I'm not sure if you can see what tools are in her hand, I, I can't tell, but she might not even have any at this point, but she had a set of tools behind her that she knew the name of all of them. And she was working on making a winch that then successfully lifted our robot up during the competition. Um, so in a five week time period, we went from not knowing the difference between a <laughs> nut and a bolt, she didn't know the difference between a screw and a nail, which I, I was like, a, it screws in. It, ha it's, it turns, the other one doesn't. And we had to talk about it. And now, um, you'll see farther along is that she's building something completely on her own in my spring term course. Um, and it's been incredible. And all of this, I also attest to project-based learning. If we were sitting in a class and we were reading a textbook um, and having a <coughs> conversation as a group where she was told to do assignments to figure out what size screw to use, she would have never raised her hand to ask that question what's the difference between a nut and a bolt? Because we would have been so far beyond that that the opportunity to ask that question would have been alien. I'm completely 110% confident that Catherine would have either failed or dropped out of my class um, if this hadn't been project-based, if she hadn't had the opportunity to ask one-on-one -on -one questions, <coughs> if she hadn't had the opportunity to try it and to fail, to take a screw and use a hammer and find out that that wasn't what you're supposed to do in the privacy of a conversation between me and one other, when one other student and herself. <laughs> if that had been in front of the entire class, if she had been asked to give a presentation and to do that, she would have been laughed at. She would have been mortified. Um, and so instead, we were able to have these conversations. And you can see she's got a little smile there, and you'll, you'll see some other pictures of her throughout this. So that was incredible. This is also robotic season. Um, so first robotics is uh, a <coughs> robotics competition. And we do it a little bit different than other schools where we have it as a class rather than um, like an after school activity. Um, so we have a number of different sections and students in each of those classes have to communicate across the classes, which is the most difficult part um, to build a robot. Um, this is Allison Broly. Um, she of course is another female student of mine. You can see I take pictures of the, the students that don't fit in the most because they're the most interesting for me. Um, Allison was, only about a step or two above Catherine's knowledge <laughs> when she entered the class. Um, and I told her this day that she could use a hacksaw to cut a bolt off of something that she needed. And she actually asked me to film this to send to her parents because she was so proud of herself. Her parents that, by the way, are incredibly educated. Her dad is the head of the American Cancer Society. He came to lecture at our school. Like These are very educated people doing great things with their lives. And she said, send this to my dad. He's going to be so <laughs> proud of me. <laughs> So that's what that one is. It's just two seconds, but you can see a little joy on her face. <laughs> um, okay, and this is the culmination of FIRST Robotics. Um, yet again, just I'd like you to imagine if you've ever been in a lecture hall that has ever sounded or looked like this. Please start that one. It's a lot of yelling, it's a lot of long days, 
And then to also give you perspective is that we had all of our students leave campus at 6 a.m. and come back at 10 p.m. And this was day three, and they still sounded like this. <laughs> um, okay, so now we make it to the class that I'm in now um, that I've completely redesigned. Um, it's called Engineering Projects. And typically in the past, students have come in and they've said, uh, this is what I want to work on, and then go do it. Um, and at the end, they say, this is what I built. Um, which, as we've very clearly talked about throughout this, is that that skips the brainstorming process that students don't want to do, and it skips the reflection process that students really don't want to do. Um, and so what I've done instead is that um, the first thing was that I challenged them all to do something that would either help campus or help people, um, rather than just themselves, or rather than just something to build for the sake of it. To think about the user, to think about the consumer, and to try to think about St. Paul's. Um, so this is Spencer, um, and that's his partner, Max. Um, they're building something that's called Paramotor, which is essentially a giant fan that you put on your back, um, and then you can get on a bike, or get on a scooter, or get on a skateboard, and be propelled forward. Um, so one thing that I've challenged them to do is to have the conversation of what if somebody was in a wheelchair and they wanted to use this? Um, and so what Spencer has done since then is he changed, it used to be um, a very different vest and now he's done it so that he could actually sit into a wheelchair, this could sit on the back of it and would successfully propel him forward. Um, so that's them ducting the edges to try and make it more efficient. Um, so this is Shalai and Alex. Uh, it's hard to tell, but they are building um, like a tri-wheeled, a tri-wheeled um, suitcase essentially, or like a carrier to go up the stairs. But their understanding being that students have a really hard time getting um, cases of water up to the third floor or getting um, their suitcases to and from the third floor of dorms, especially during the time of the year when you have to move in and out. We give them about a day to move all of their things out, and they said it's really hard to do. So with the idea being um, that as you go up the stairs, um, the three wheels allow it to actually wheel itself up the stairs, rather than when you use a suitcase, it's this, I didn't get the size quite right. Um, it's probably more like this. Um, and so as you're going, it continues to sort of could pop itself up each step rather than when you use a regular wheeled suitcase and you just get stuck and then you sort of pull it up and pull it over and pull it up and pull it over. It just does that for itself. Um, so that's what they're working on. They're very excited that it's going to be done by the time they can move out of their dorms this year. Um, this is Foster and Emma and they are building a robot with a scanner with the idea being um, that they can teach students how to program, um, young students how to program. So it has a barcode scanner and they're creating little blocks um, that show very simple images like a forward arrow, a backwards arrow, a left and right arrow. They take the robot and they scan the blocks and then in whatever order they scan it in, then they press go and the robot does exactly what they scanned it to do with the idea being that that is the simplest level of programming um, to be able to think about the steps you want to accomplish, put them in the right order and then execute them. Okay, so this is <laughs> Catherine again with her partner, Olivia. Um, they are building a milk dispenser, so that probably sounds really funny if you don't go to St. Paul's. Um, but at St. Paul's, we have something called dorm milk, which is where all of the dorms um, get glass milk bottles every week um, and keep them in their fridge, and they're allowed to drink them throughout the day at any point they want. If they want to have breakfast in the dorm, they can. Um, and Livia and Catherine have decided to make a dispenser because what happens is lots of students drop the glass milk bottles and then have sour milk and glass all over the floor. And so they have actually built this so that these two little motors are pumps with little buttons that they've now since 3D printed bigger buttons to go on top of. Um, and they just press the button and it comes out of a spout right in the front um, and eliminates all of the mess and the glass. Um, still the most exciting part of this for me being that Catherine is using tools and on every major tool in the shop, cutting pieces of Lexan, talking to me about L brackets, asking me, you know, that she wants a quarter inch bolt instead of, you know, the half inch that she has and talking to me about the, the you know, the threads on it and telling me the other day that she stripped, stripped one of them and I was like, you know what that means? <laughs> I don't even care that you stripped it. You can tell me what that is. 
Um, <laughs> this is um, Stephen, his partner's not pictured. They're making um, a plane that has a wing that solar cells sit on top of. Um, so as it flies, it charges itself from the sun, and so it doesn't need to be charged by a battery. It could hopefully, ideally, continue to fly forever if it's sunny out, continuing to charge its own battery by the sun. So the students picking these projects themselves are the ones designing them? Yeah. Yeah, so I embedded them, um, asking them in the beginning, will this help the school, and will this help people, and how? Um, and then I also vetted them being, what is our time frame and what is our budget? Essentially, my worst vetting being on Mia's project. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and challenged them throughout it. So they also had to create their own budgets, um, create their own construction plans and timelines. And I've made it very clear that if you don't finish and it's anyone's fault but mine, um, that's not, a, you don't pass, that's, that's unacceptable. Um, so they're in crunch time at the moment. Let's see. There you go. So now we have Will and Mia. And I'm going to let Mia tell you about her project. Um, and then I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to ask Mia, and then as well as myself, any questions that you have. My guess being that Mia's answers are significantly more interesting than my own now that I've talked so much. Um, so this is my partner, Will, and I. And at the beginning of the term, we wanted to make uh, a floating dock, like the ones you see on lakes and stuff, for uh, the lower school ponds on our campus, which is like a place where people swim and stuff. And originally, we wanted to have it have solar-powered lights, a call box. That would be like for safety reasons, because we knew that like safety was going to be a reason why this dock wouldn't be allowed to be in the water. So we thought ahead, and we were like, let's have a call box for it. Um, and so as we got going, we made a budget. Um, we just planned it all out, really. And we had everything set to go. And then I think the timeline is really what got in our way, because towards, I want to say, like mid-May, beginning early May, um, the school told us, they were like, you guys aren't allowed to have this in the water. Um, they were afraid that if the anchor like got loose or something, it would float into one. There's these things like culverts at our school, and so there's like river blockades. They were afraid that the raft was going to float and flood the school. Um, <laughs> and so that, so that was an issue, but then also we didn't know that we had to have a permit from the state of New Hampshire to have a floating, uh, floating structure. And that, to even get a permit, it takes like to 100 days and it's a $200 fee. And we didn't have that money because our budget was already like super past the level. We had to go through <laughs> the business office and ask for funds from like alumni who gave donations for science projects like this. So we can like have all the materials, the wood and all that stuff. Um, so we really got limited with that step because we were like, all right, well, why build it if it can't even like be of any use to anyone? Um, but so we build a section. So this is only a section of the dock. It was originally supposed to be eight by eight. So like a square, eight feet by eight feet. This is four by four. And to complete the dock, we'd have to make four more sections of these. And each section would only have one barrel. This has two because when we do put it in the water, because we were going to put this in the water, but it's not going to stay there forever. So we want it to float, and if it only had one barrel, it wouldn't float or it wouldn't be leveled. Um, but yeah, I'd say I really liked our project. The reason why we wanted to do it was because both Will and I really like working with like wood and construction. and. I think a lot of other people chose like the mechanical way because they wanted to make something like super cool and abstract and like that could help the school but we decided to like go with like what we know how to do which I'm super happy with because even though we didn't get to finish it and like it's not a product it's not a final product that's going to be in the ponds anytime soon um, we're super happy that we even got this far because there were times where we were like uh, this is never going to happen. Um, so, no, yeah, we're really proud of this. I'd say, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then one note of mine is that 
something I'm not sure Mia has fully learned yet, um, but I'll tell her, which I don't usually tell my students what they're going to learn, um, is that engineering always stems beyond the engineering lab, something I think that engineers forget too often. Um, something I've had these students do is that they have a knowledgeable person or knowledgeable people that they need to reach out to throughout the term and have a meeting with bi-weekly. Um, and it has to be somebody that doesn't work in the building. Um, and so what Mia isn't bragging and telling you about is all of the things that she learned that I think a lot of the other students didn't learn. With that being that um, these barrels were donated by her facilities. She went and met people that I'm not sure she knew before. She spoke with IT about how a call box would be installed on it um, if that were to happen. She learned about permits from the state that I didn't even know about she was going to need. I, I would have, like I said, I, this is my worst vetting uh, that I've done is because I should have asked the school if this would be allowed to be put in. I didn't. Um, and so she has taught me a lot in her project. Um, as well as, I think, learning the biggest lesson that I've been trying to teach this term, that engineering is much bigger than our lab and our classroom. And the fun happens in here, um, but it always has to interact with other people outside of the room. So yeah, that's our, that's our presentation. I'm to you because you're more interesting. Okay. <laughs> so Mia. Yes. What is the thing that you took from this project, what's the most important? And the second thing, in your opinion, what was the biggest challenge that you had to Um, I'd say the biggest challenge for sure was, aside from like getting the materials and being limited like by all these outside factors, like within Will and I, our biggest struggle, I'd say, was um, probably <coughs> the communication just between the two of us. Um, because Will is very, he like builds these things over the summer, like for a job. He knows how to do this. And when I was working with him, there were moments where I was afraid to ask questions to him because I didn't want him to think like I was, I didn't know anything or like to think less of me. So that was one of them. But I still, I asked him and he was super nice about it, obviously. But like that was, that was one thing that like definitely held me back a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that I take away from this is definitely just that like, no matter how many setbacks you have, you can always come back and it may not be what you wanted it to be in the end, but it is something and you should still be proud of it, for sure. Congratulations. That's great. Important, yes. Yeah. One, one, one of the things that we all, I always say is most People usually talk, when they talk to engineers, they talk about knowledge. But that's not what determines success in engineering. Number one issue that I find with engineers is communication. Yes, they understand the problem, but what about their ability to explain it, okay? What about their ability to ask the right question, okay? These are the most difficult things you find in the workplace. You find people so much knowledge with the inability to share it with them, to ask the right question, to ask the help from the right person. These are the problems that the engineers encounter at work. Me, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you've learned these <laughs> lessons from the beginning. Yeah. You will be a great engineer. <laughs> Jane, do you differentiate between project-based learning and design-based learning? Um, I don't. I think that um, in order to have project-based learning, you need to include the design. Um, I think, I mean, my understanding of the differentiation between the two is that, or at least the way that I've experienced it, is that when somebody tells me in, that it's design-based learning, it means that you are coming up with the project and executing the project, where project-based learning is just doing something that someone else told you. Um, Maybe you have a different understanding of it, but that's been my understanding, and so I don't differentiate <coughs> because I think it should all include the beginning, the middle, and the end. Yeah, in the extremes, project-based learning is a checklist that you they follow to get it done. Design-based learning is a paper. You've got a blending of the two. Yes. I always include the brainstorming process, so even if I have an understanding of sort of what that checklist is, I try my best not to tell the students. Um, and then there, of course, is the point where you have to stop them and say, you are well, so far left, you're never going to reach where I want you to. Let's come back a little bit. 
Um, but I try, I try to always have the blank sheet. Okay, so I did it my senior year of high school, which was like last year, and it was a, it's a lot like how your classroom is, and it was one of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had. Um, basically, it's all a STEM competition, and you can start when you're in preschool, and it can go, it can go into college as well. And you are given, you can choose from um, several different categories. Um, my group from my school chose, we're a very small group, um, we chose something that has to do with theater and the arts, but there are a lot of engineering-based projects. Um, and basically what we did is we had, with no help from anyone else, we had to come up with a seven-minute skit based off of a certain time error that we had to choose, and it had to all incorporate different, um, different aspects of what they're asking. And then we created, with a budget, we created um, our own costumes uh, with recycled materials and such. And we actually made it to Globals in Tennessee, so that was awesome. And it's my first year doing it. But um, another part of the competition was these, um, you were also graded on these little projects you had to do at the competition. So you weren't given anything beforehand, but you could practice with um, certain examples that they would send out to you. And you had, you walked, it's very nerve wracking. You walk into a room, and it's exactly like what you do. They give you a sheet of paper. These are the materials you have. This is what you have to make. And these are the points you get um, if you complete this. And you, for um, depends on what the project is, but for two minutes you can't, you can't touch the materials. You all have to brainstorm together. And um, then you create it and then you, um, you know, put it into action. And so that was something that it challenged me a lot but I really enjoyed it, and it makes you a lot closer to your classmates and your teammates. So I was wondering if you ever heard of that, because that would be something that you could definitely work into your um, curriculum. Or I know my teacher, we, we didn't have it in our school. Um, actually, Texas has it integrated into their school system. But um, she did it after school, and it was, um, it was with all my really good friends, and I became super close with that teacher. And that's another thing I was wondering. Do you find that you have a closer bond with the students because you're doing a project? Yeah, I mean, I loved my, I love my teachers so much because you get to interact with them a lot more outside of the classroom. It's not as stressful. And um, yeah, and another question I had was when you were um, with your mentor, did you find that after the project-based learning and um, with the physics class and students that went on to AP physics, did they score higher or about average or lower? How did you feel about that? I know we have a hard time hearing about this. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, we did find that in AP physics, students did better. Um, with the most interesting part of that, I'm sure you've all heard of this research, is that if students believe they're going to do well on a test, if they enter into a test saying, I'm going to do well, they do better than if they go into the test saying they're not going to do well. And it's amazing that you can just convince a student to say that and change nothing about their study habits um, and their mindset changes it that much. Um, but we did find um, over a number of years actually that it was sort of an upward trend and of course it plateaued at a certain point. Um, but we were just talking about it the other day is that um, he is still studying to get another master's degree and is using what we started to do research um, and to, yeah, to do a final thesis on it. Um, finding that as he increases the amount of project-based learning that happens in his classroom, the test scores, scores go up. Um, and it's you know similar to what I found for myself is that um, machine design was a fascinating class, like, it was just a super nerdy thing for me to tell you. Um, but I don't remember actual gear ratios, and I don't remember you know actual threading on screws, and you know all of the clearances and the different things. But I understand why they mattered. And so I have a close enough understanding and the physical, you know, I experienced it rather than just being taught it. Um, and that hands-on experience has helped me remember the point of it so much and has 
made it feel like such a better access point. Like I now, like I still have all of my textbooks from school, many of them that I don't open, and many of them when I do, I feel a little bit like blindsided by the information that's in front of my face. And when I open my machine design textbook, I actually open it remembering looking through those pages while I built that can crusher. Um, and so I think that it's a very similar thing for the project-based learning and the students on the test, um, is that you know often in physics you're asked to draw a picture to go along. Um, and they can do that because they've actually done something that gives them an image to go along with what they're talking about. So yeah, we have definitely seen a good response. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for listening to us.